In the next of our series of examples of systems of linear ODEs solved using diagonalization, we're going to take a look at two additional eventualities. One is higher order equations, because not all of our differential equations in science and engineering are first order, so what happens if they're second or higher order? And then the second eventuality we want to take a look at is what happens if we get complex or imaginary eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So we're going to look at both of those situations in this particular section. So let's suppose that we have a capital nth order ordinary differential equation. The superscript capital N in parentheses here means the capital nth derivative, so there's no confusion with powers. So the capital nth derivative of u is a linear function of the independent variable t, the dependent variable u, its first derivative, second derivative, up to the n minus first derivative. And so we want to convert this one capital nth order ODE into a system of capital N first order ODEs that are mathematically equivalent. We do that through a substitution, a relatively simple one. So our original dependent variable was u, t, u of t, just one dependent variable. And now we're going to introduce capital N new dependent variables. u1 will simply be the original u. u2 will be u dot. u3 will be u double dot. u4 will be u triple dot. All the way down to the very last equation, u cap n will be the n minus first derivative of u. So n minus one dots, if you will. Then what we do to get our equivalent first order system, we take the substitution and simply differentiate each of the equations. So we'll have u1 dot is equal to u dot, u2 dot is equal to u double dot, u3 dot is equal to u triple dot, and so forth, all the way through all of these equations. When you do that, you get this. So here's the u1 dot, u2 dot, u3 dot, here's the u dot, u double dot, u triple dot, on the right hand side. And then you just have to remember I want everything in terms of these new u sub 1, 2, 3 through n variables. I don't want to see any of the original variables u. So I need to get rid of the u here. So remember u dot, well that's just equal to u2 in our substitution. u double dot, well that's just equal to u3 in our substitution. u triple dot, well that's just equal to u4 in our substitution. So then I have u1 dot is equal to u2. u2 dot is equal to u3. u3 dot is equal to u4. Continue that through all of the equations. The very last equation is going to be u sub cap n dot is equal to u n of t. But u n of t, what is that? That is the original right hand side of our differential equation. That's the capital F. Again, remembering to substitute all the u's and their derivatives for the u1's, u2's, three un's, as you see here. Of course, we'll do an example and you'll be able to see how this works out in a, a clearer way. So in formulating this new system of equations, be sure that all of the dependent variables are u1, u2, three un, none of the original u variables. Secondly, we can use this process to convert any system of higher order linear differential equations into a system of first order equations that's mathematically equivalent. So it doesn't have to be a single nth order equation. It could be, for example, three coupled second order equations, which would result in three times two, six first order equations that are all coupled together. So we'll illustrate this in the, in the next couple of examples to show how we can do that. This first order form is known as the state space representation of the system in dynamical systems. So we're going to look at an example of a second order ODE. We're going to convert it into two first order ODEs and use the diagonalization process to solve it. This equation is so simple that you may actually be able to look at it and remember the solution uh, right away. So we're, we're not doing this necessarily the quickest or easiest way, but to illustrate the two new pieces, which is complex eigenvalues eigenvectors and how to treat higher order equations. So here we have a second order equation, d squared u dt squared plus u is equal to zero, or u double dot if you prefer, plus u is equal to zero. You may remember from a differential equations class or even a dynamics class that the solution to this is simply u of t is a constant times cosine 
t plus a constant times sine t. In fact, this is the governing equation for an undamped harmonic oscillator. Uh, but again, we're, let's do it using the approach that we just discussed and then use diagonalization to solve the system. We have our initial conditions. u at 0 is 1, u dot at 0 is 2. So we have one equation that is second order. So we're going to need two new variables, u1 and u2. So u1 will be the original u variable and u2 will be u dot. Once again, we differentiate. So u1 dot is equal to u dot, and u2 dot is equal to u double dot. u double dot we get from the original equation, u double dot plus u is equal to zero. So to see how that all works out, we have u1 dot is equal to u dot. Again, I don't want to see any u's, I just want to see u1s and u2s. So I look at my substitution and I remember, oh, u dot, that's just u2. And then u2 dot from the second equation is u double dot. u double dot from the original differential equation is equal to minus u. And minus u in terms of u1 and u2 is u1. So we have minus u1. So our system of two first order equations is u1 dot is equal to u2. And u2 dot is equal to minus u1. Again, no u's, only u1 and u2. So in matrix form, this is a homogeneous system. There's no f. So we have our two by one vector of differentiated variables is equal to our A matrix times U. First thing we notice, A is not symmetric, right? So once again, we'll take a look at the eigenvalues and see what that means in terms of what we expect for the eigenvectors. To get the eigenvalues, I'm gonna do the details here because they're gonna turn out different than what we've been encountering thus far. So we take the determinant of a minus lambda i is equal to zero. Here it is. So just subtract off lambda from the main diagonal terms. So we do the determinant, which is minus lambda times minus lambda minus plus one times minus one. And that gives us lambda squared plus one is equal to zero. We factor that quadratic and we get plus and minus i, i being the imaginary number, square root of minus one, and that's because of this plus sign here. So we get distinct eigenvalues, first of all. So we have a non-symmetric matrix, but with distinct eigenvalues. So the diagonalization process will work. We should get linearly independent eigenvectors, as will be the case. But the new piece that we see here is that our eigenvalues happen to be imaginary. They happen to be complex. There's no reason mathematically why this can't happen and certainly physically it can. Again, this is the governing equation for an undamped harmonic oscillator. So of course this could happen physically. But for now, let's just proceed as before and then we'll see when the need arises what is different when we have this situation with complex eigenvalues. We get the eigenvectors using, using the usual process. So these are regular eigenvectors. They're i1 and minus i1. So they are complex, but they are regular eigenvectors. Let's form our modal matrix in the usual way. So here's u1 and u2, of course imaginary. That's fine for now, let's just continue and see what happens. Then the u inverse times a times u will still diagonalize. In our derivations of that, we did not restrict ourselves to real eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So the diagonalization process still works just like before. So when we convert from u to v using the modal matrix capital U, the process will work the same in terms of getting the uncoupled solution. v1 will be c1 e to the minus i t, minus i is lambda 1, and v2 is equal to c2 e to the i t, again i being lambda 2. Then we convert back to our original variables. This is the solution in terms of v. We multiply by u to get the solution in terms of the original variables u. Now, if you think about this, we've actually done two substitutions. We went from the original dependent variable u. We converted our second order equation for u to a system of two equations for u1 and u2. And then we converted u1 and u2, which is our u vector, to a new vector v, so v1 and v2. And then we convert back twice. So from v back to u vector, and from u vector back to u scalar. 
When we do that, remember u is just u1. So I actually don't use the u2 that we got in that intermediate uh, substitution. So u is u1, which is c1i e to the minus it minus c2i e to the plus it. So that's the general solution for u. Normally at this stage we would be done unless we have initial conditions, which we do here. We'll get to those in a second. Uh, and we'd be done, we have the general solution. But we need to talk about how to deal with the fact that we have this imaginary solution. So to do that, we take advantage of this fact here. So for linear equations, both the real and the imaginary parts of the complex solution are themselves solutions of the differential equations. So we can use linear superposition of the real part and the imaginary part, which are both real, superimpose them together to get the most general solution of the differential equation. So this is always true for linear systems, the superposition principle, and we're going to apply it here to the complex solution, remembering that the real part which is real and the imaginary part which is also real are both solutions of the differential equation. We can combine them, superimpose them to get the most general form of the solution. The way we do that is to use what's called Euler's formula. Euler's formula is derived in complex variables, and it says that e to a constant times it can be written as cosine at, where a is that constant, plus i sine at. So in that way, we can turn this exponential, which has the i embedded in that exponential, into a real part plus i times an imaginary part. So doing that here, we have our original u, which we just got, is c1 i e to the minus i t minus c2 i e to the i t. We substitute in the Euler formula for e to the minus i t, where a is minus i, and e to the i t, where a is i, to get these in square brackets. So we get a cosine minus t plus i sine minus t, and cosine t plus i sine t. Then you remember your trig identities. So for cosine of minus t, cosine is an even function. So cosine minus t is the same as cosine t. Sine of minus t, sine is an odd function. So sine of minus t is minus sine t. And so we can write this in this form right here. You'll notice we have some imaginary terms with i's. i times i is minus one. So that is a real term. This is imaginary, and again, i times i, this is a real term. So we can break out the real part and the imaginary part of u. So the real part is this constant c1 plus c2, all times sine t, and the imaginary part is c1 minus c2, all times cosine t. So the real part and the imaginary part of our solution, which we just got using Euler's formula, each of those are now individually solutions of our original differential equation, which you could check. We can superimpose them to obtain the most general solution for u. So we're going to throw away the c's, c1 and c2, and just wrap everything into a's and b's. So we have a constant times sine and a constant times cosine, which is exactly what we said at the very beginning of the example. If you remember the solution to u double dot plus u is equal to zero, this is what we get. So it took us several slides and, and quite a bit of extra effort, but again, illustrating how to convert a higher order equation to a system of first order equations and how to do diagonalization when you have complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The A and the B we obtain here using the initial conditions where you get A is two, B is one, and that gives us the final solution to our differential equation with those initial conditions. As always, you can check these, put this back into the original equation, confirm that it satisfies both the equation as well as the initial conditions, which it does. So this is an example where, because of the imaginary eigenvalues, we end up with these sines and cosines, which are just oscillatory behavior, which is exactly what we would expect for an undamped harmonic oscillator. So again, the physics and the math are beautifully married together. Everything makes sense from a physical point of view, from a mathematical point of view, we have a real solution for a real problem. Once again, this is the undamped harmonic oscillator problem. So in fact, these initial conditions are initial conditions on 
the position as well as the velocity u and u dot, position and velocity of the spring in this harmonic oscillator. Finally, let me just make a couple of general comments. So this approach that we've used here to get the final real solution applies again for any linear equation or system of linear equations where superposition holds. And finally, we've seen over and over again in science and engineering that many of our systems are governed by nonlinear equations, not by linear ones. For now, I'll just refer you ahead to chapter five, specifically sections 5.5 and 5.6, where we look at some really interesting nonlinear differential equations, the types of behaviors that can occur, including deterministic chaos and, and so on. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a later section. Right now, we're focused on linear systems of equations.